the Triathlon Show 275. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Michael Crawley. Michael is a two-hour, 20-minute marathon runner who has competed internationally for Scotland and Great Britain, and he's assistant prof- professor in social anthropology at Durham University. Michael spent 15 months in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, where he was running with a group of professional runners uh, in a project where he was observing their training and their lives. And the result of that project uh, and the experience is Michael's first book called Out of Thin Air, Running Wisdom and Magic from Above the Clouds in Ethiopia. The book is already released, available everywhere you get your books. I have listened to it and I highly recommend it. Uh, but uh, we'll get into the interview with Michael and uh, talk about some of the main takeaways regarding the training, in particular, of the Ethiopian runners right after we thank our sponsors, Precision Hydration. Precision Hydration creates electrolyte products that you can match to your individual sweat sodium concentration level. Now that spring is coming, perhaps you are spending some more time doing longer rides and runs. And during such long workouts in particular, you end up actually losing a lot of sodium, especially if your uh, sweat sodium concentration level is high and your sweat rate is high. And in those circumstances, uh, replacing sodium can be really crucial for maintaining a good, a good performance level throughout your workout because getting too low on sodium can have uh, severe performance impacts, not to mention other things like potentially cramping, nausea, and so on. You can take a free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com to get a good estimate for your own sweat sodium concentration level, and you can get 15% off your order of electrolytes with the promo code DETTRIATHLONSHOW15. And thank you to Roca that you can find on roca.com. For many triathletes, the swim is our weak leg and it can be really, really difficult to improve our performance in the water just through training alone. So uh, it's good to know that to some extent, you can actually buy performance by having a really best-in-class equipment. And Roka's wetsuits and swimskins are perfect examples of that. Uh, the wetsuits have their patented arms of technology that you know of, and uh, it, these are present even in the entry-level wetsuits. And when you go all the way up to the high-end wetsuits, they have all sorts of additional bells and whistles, including things like special taping to include uh, to increase the power transfer from your lower body to your upper body to maximize your propulsion in the water. The swim skins also come with uh, the arms of technology and uh, the textile and coatings used minimize drag in the water. The Viper X swim skin uh, comes with that same special taping technology that connects the movement of your lower body and core to your upper body to increase power transfer in your stroke. So whether you're uh, planning on racing races where that are likely to be wetsuit legal or uh, races in conditions where you will not be allowed to have your wetsuit and uh, you would be well served to have a swim skin, Roka is a great place to go and shop for the best possible in the equipment categories there. And by the way, don't forget to bring your swim skin even to races you think are bound to be wetsuit legal because you never know. I made this mistake for the Ironman 7.3 World Championships in Nice in 2019 where I did not bring my swim skin and then it ended up being having been so warm for the last couple of weeks, uh, unusually warm, and uh, it was a non-wetsuit swim. And I did it in my Roka tri suit, which was fine, but of course I would have liked to have a swim skin on top of that to improve my swim split a little bit. You can get 20% off your entire Roka order on roka.com forward slash TTS. Now without any further ado, let's get into the interview with Michael Crawley. I'm here with uh, Michael Crawley. Michael, welcome to the Triathlon Show. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Thank you for having me. Uh, It's a great pleasure. Uh, I was just uh, telling you how towards the end of 2020, I uh, listened to your book, or the audio version of it, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. So it will be great to uh, dive a bit deeper into it. But uh, before we do, can you please introduce yourself a little bit more and and also introduce the project of 
going and living in Ethiopia and that ended up with writing the book. Sure, yeah. So um, I'm now an assistant professor in social anthropology at Durham University. Um, but this the book project really came about because I did a, a PhD in anthropology that involved doing research with um, Ethiopian runners. So I was interested in um, in basically trying to understand what anthropologists call the life world of the Ethiopian runner. So trying to understand what the world looks like to somebody who is trying to change their life um, as they tend to, tended to describe it through the sport of running. So looking at it as kind of an economic um, phenomenon as much as anything else um, and as kind of a form of work that that people were, um, were undertaking. But I've always kind of been interested in, I suppose, running cultures a bit more broadly. So um, I was interested in the running culture of the northeast of England um, in the 1980s when we were producing um, incredible runners uh, just who were kind of running around their uh, day jobs, I suppose, but still managing to put in 100 miles a week and um, and run uh, phenomenal times and get medals at the Olympic Games and things like that. So I've been I've always kind of been interested in in running as a sort of um, as a culture, I suppose. So I, I took that with me to Ethiopia, and I, I always had in the back of my mind that whilst I was doing research for a PhD, I wanted to write a popular book that um, that kind of told the story of Ethiopian running um, because usually when we, we talk about sort of East African running, I think we're mainly sort of focused on Kenya because people speak English in Kenya a bit better. It's a bit more accessible. It's easier to go there. Um, but it always made me uncomfortable the way that commentators would refer to the East Africans as if they were kind of this homogenous group. And um, I kind of knew that even within Ethiopia, it's very uh, varied. There's a, a lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different languages spoken. Um, so it's silly to refer to to East Africa as this kind of big group. So I wanted to dive deeper into what um, what Ethiopian running was all about, basically. Yeah, and uh, you made a point there that uh, you wanted to write a popular book, and uh, we should highlight that. I think that uh, this is not a scholarly book; it's not a book about anthropology, and it's also not a training guidebook. It's it's a a story; it's a it's a narrative in my mind, at least as a as a reader of it. So, and uh, and also to bring your background a bit to to the fore here before we go go into the actual contents of the book. You're a very handy runner yourself, aren't you? Yeah, so I um, I run two twenty for a marathon, uh, and I finished about I, I finished. I think the best of, I finished is seventh in the Scottish um, National Cross Country Championship. So I went to Ethiopia, I suppose, as quite as somebody who is used to being, you know, towards the front of of sort of national championship races in the country that I was from. So it was quite interesting going into a context where I was suddenly. Um, more or less the slowest uh, in, in any race that I entered. So um, it was a good demonstration that it's all relative. But I think um, the fact that, you know, being being able to run sort of 220-ish meant that I was able to at least jump in on some of the training sessions and, and kind of hang on for a, for a while in long runs and, and sort of get a sense for for what that kind of, what the running looked like from from within the group, I suppose, even though, you know, I wasn't able to keep up on some of the faster sessions, but I was able to do enough to, um, to be able to write about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really awesome that you, you got that experience to do that, but it, it does bring, you have some funny passages in the book. I uh, remember when you described talking with the bus driver of the team bus and, uh, uh, you asked the bus driver, I think if he, if he had been a runner and he said mm. he tried it, but, uh, but he wasn't fast enough. And then he realized that he was very similar to you, I think in ability or even faster. Uh, yeah. He'd, um, he'd had a go at running for about 18 months and, uh, he said he'd run 30, zero five for a 10 K and then decided that that was too slow to bother continuing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is crazy because that's a, that's also, a, um, at altitude as well. So, uh, yeah. my 10 kpb is 3007 so he was faster than me and he'd already given up <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so so let's uh, let's maybe uh start by discussing what a day in a life of these ethiopian runners uh, might look like sure so um we we trained hard three days a week um from addis and the way that um, it basically works is that most of the most of the professional runners live in the city um so they they catch a bus out 
to um, to more interesting and sort of varied places to train three mornings a week. So on a Monday, a Wednesday and a Friday, we would get up at 4.30 in the morning um, and then walk down in the darkness to catch a bus to go um, to go somewhere to the mountain in Toto or to, um, to somewhere that was seen as um, a good environment for running. And then on the other days, we'd get up uh, we'd have a bit of a lion and get up more like 5.30 um, and go up to the forest in time for dawn breaking, basically. Um, so every day we'd start with running um, so either, either a session or just running in the forest for maybe an hour and 20 minutes, something like that. Um, often on the on the days when we went in a bus, we, it would take until sort of 11 o'clock in the morning to get back home because the, we'd get stuck in traffic on the way back into Addis Ababa. Um, so we tend to get back home really hungry and tired and then um, eat a big meal and then go to sleep for a portion of the afternoon. Um, on the easy running days, we tend often people would sort of start running in one part of the forest and then finish up somewhere else and go and uh, meet a friend or something for a little bit or go shopping in the market or something. It was oft, often the running was a little bit more sort of um, intertwined with everyday life activities than it often would be for uh, for runners in the west i think um but then most of the day was spent sort of relaxing trying to sleep a little bit and recover um and then we'd go for a second run about four o'clock in the afternoon um eat dinner together normally and then people would go to bed about nine nine thirty because we'd be up again at four thirty the next day so quite a simple um lifestyle really but training training basically twice every day apart from Sundays when um people would usually have a day off um go to church and relax instead of running the runners you were training with the group uh, were all of them professional runners so they didn't have day jobs to to deal with no so most people if they decide that they're going to run then they describe running as their job and and they don't tend to do anything else apart from run um, so most of the people that I knew, they, uh, they were supported in their running through, uh, a, a local club. So there's a, an awful lot of, um, the running clubs in Ethiopia are sponsored by either kind of, uh, banks or the prison service or the army or, um, like a cement factory or something like that. Um, but they pay runners, they pay a team of runners, basically a, a salary that is enough to pay their rent and, um, and basically live off uh, so that they can focus on their running. So people would, people basically saw running and other forms of work as quite incompatible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they were full-time athletes. Yeah. And, and how much uh, running would a typical week include, uh, whether it's in kilometers or in hours? Uh, what, what would that train load be? Um, probably better to, do it in hours i think it'd pro- probably be about two hours of running a day yeah. most days um and then obviously a rest on a sunday so maybe 12 hours of running yeah. um it's a bit hard with the kilometers thing because i mean um you read the book you know how much of the running i describe is sort of in in forests that are very densely packed with eucalyptus trees and very steep um and rocky and so an hour and 20 minute run in that kind of environment can often not actually be that many kilometers so we'd, yeah. that would sometimes only be 12 13k in the morning um and then 40 minutes in the afternoon maybe just 7k something like that so it sometimes if you if you translate it into kilometers it doesn't sound like that that much but because of the terrain and the um and the altitude it's probably better to quantify it by time i guess yeah yeah and i think that's something that uh this is uh, primarily a triathlon audience and uh, because of the the bike element and different ways of training we're all used to dealing in time i think it's uh, in in running the kilometers or miles is very established but for for this audience it's not a problem to deal with with time um so when you had those sessions that you described on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, uh, are there any examples you can give regularly regularly occurring hard workouts that you were doing and uh, that were kind of the bread and butter of the training program? Yeah, so uh, Monday was basically always a run on a surface that was referred to in Amharic, which is the main language that the runner spoke, as Korakonch, uh, which is basically like a rough road, like a stony, gravelly road. Um, and they they described that as being important because the surface itself was kind of built strength 
in runners because you were constantly sort of slipping back as you were as you were running. Um, and so we would go to go to that kind of road, which was also very undulating. So just like big downhill sections for um, maybe three kilometers and then big uphills for three kilometers. Um, and we'd run between an hour and 40 and maybe two and a half hours on a Monday morning. Um, and that would be the coach would set the pace for those kinds of runs, um, working down from about four minutes per kilometer down to about three twenty, three ten by the end of the run. So they were generally um, quite sort of progressive runs um, and pretty pretty hard. Um, so I would often we would always have the team bus would kind of trundle along behind us um, as we did these kinds of runs. So I'd be able to do half of it and then jump on the bus basically when I couldn't yeah. keep up anymore. Um, so that was Monday. Um, Wednesday mornings would be a speed session. Um, and whilst the coach was quite keen on trying to hold people back and make sure that they didn't overtrain and give them sort of predetermined paces to run on, on kind of a Monday and a Friday on a Wednesday, he would just, he would let people run as hard as they wanted. So we'd either go uh, to a track or we'd go to like a big grassy field. Um, and most of those sessions were just done on, on the watch. So uh, one minute, two minutes, three minutes hard times six or something like that. Um, so not, I mean, there are also kind of sessions that you would ex- expect to see, I guess, in, in most places. Um, with those interval sessions, they'd normally add up to about 36 minutes of running, something like that, of hard running and then easy jogging yeah. in between. Um, and then on a Friday, to, the only time that we would run on the road in the whole week would be on a Friday morning. So that's something that's quite different, I think, to to the way that a lot of people train um, in Europe and America. So it was very much the case that people would try hard to avoid hard surfaces. But on a Friday, we would go to a, a stretch of road that was measured um, with uh, these kind of white posts in the road that mark the kilometers. And we'd do something like um, uh, 25 kilometers where you run 4K hard and then 1K steady and then 4K hard um alternating so you um and the, and the 1k the recovery 1k was sometimes like 330 <laughs> for a kilometer so uh, and then the what, hard running three what minutes, was 4k three hard so the, the 4k yeah, hard so, so that would minutes. correspond to so, sorry sorry uh would, would the 4k hard correspond to roughly target marathon pace or maybe slightly faster marathon pace for these runners yeah or? roughly roughly marathon pace uh yeah, so like three minutes per kilometer for for guys who are cap- maybe going to run sort of two or six something like that, but it's yeah. at that kind of altitude as well. It um, that's faster than you know than it would equate to at sea level, I guess yeah. as well. So yeah. they, those, those are like really hard runs, or sometimes it would just be you just do twenty k, um, like five k, first five k a little bit slower, and then building the pace in each five k increment. Um, yeah. until they're running sort of sub 15 minutes for the last 5k um something so, like that so i imagine that for you obviously you, you were just trying to keep up and survive so the program must inevitably have been hard but uh, how do you feel that the runners that were at the sort of like a typical runner in the group or even the faster runner in, runners in the group how how did they experience that sort of program with roughly 12 hours per week and those three hard sessions is it something that they for them is uh, quite uh, easy to sort of recover day to day or or is it is it a challenge like do how how fatigued do they get and so on just sort of how tough is that sort of training program for those runners uh i think the hard sessions could be very hard but i think they had this very um this very keen sense that you needed to run, you needed to have those three sessions that were really hard, but then you needed to make sure that the rest of the running was quite um, easy and rejuvenative in some way. So like the the logic of the running in the forest is that um, because it's so uneven um, and because it's such a difficult terrain in which to actually run quickly, it forces you to, to run a bit more slowly and to, um, they they sort of consciously saw it as a way of massaging their legs by making sure that the angles that they were running at were always slightly varied. So they were always trying to run on on sort of a camber rather than um, running straight up hills, for example. And that was seen, I think, 
people were quite concerned with making sure that they didn't overtrain. And the way that they talked about that was that they were worried about burning themselves up. That was how they put it. Um, so I think that there was this sense that the slow running that they did on the easier days was something that had to be learned just in the, in the same way that running fast has to be learned and is sort of viewed as a skill. I think they viewed that kind of slow running also as a skill that had to be mastered in order to prolong your career and make sure that you were able to make the best of the hard sessions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that using different terrain and non, non asphalt terrain and, and also running on the camber and like it just reduces the monotony of, of running and the repetitiveness of it. So it makes total sense. And a lot of coaches of course are using it in, even in Western countries, I think uh, uh, Salazar is famous for having, Mo Farah and Galen Rupp run 90% of their training on like on trails rather than, than asphalt and, and the track. Yeah. So, so it, it makes, makes total sense. And, and also just the fact that the, the running is slow means that you take less, fewer steps and because the runs are not that long, as you said. And so you get less impact just by the mere fact that you're taking fewer steps than you would on a flat mm -hmm. asphalt road. Yeah. It's, I think it's probably. It's more extreme than the kinds of off-road running that someone like Salazar would prescribe for his runners. Though, it, like the the funny thing about it was that some sometimes you'd be running up slopes that were so steep you'd need to sort of use your hands to pull yourself up with tree roots and things like that. So, yeah. so it, it did often resemble more kind of. Um, I, I think we we often separate this idea of like trail running in in the West from like marathon running and actually yeah. most of what they were doing resembled trail running more than it did anything else, um, which I think yeah. is quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, when it comes to those hard workouts, so, so you had, you, you had a mix there. It sounds like you had a speed run on the Wednesday, uh, on the Monday, you had a progressive run building up to marathon pace. And on the Friday, uh, again, something that was, marathon phase maybe slightly harder considering altitude and everything but 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 a sort of a mix of uh, of intensities there and uh, there's a lot of talk about what training tested distributions different sports and the groups of athletes are using uh, whether it's heavy on the intense side of things or the kind of moderate side of things but it sounds sounds here like like they, they, they included all sorts of intensities, including a, a big base of, of easy running and then quite a bit of race pace running, moderate intensity running, and, and, but also including that uh, consistent high intensity running. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the interesting things about it was that the way when they talked about fitness, the, the word that they, they would use the English word condition. Um, when they talked about fitness, even when they were speaking Amharic, but often when they when they said when they were talking about sort of gaining fitness, they would say um, condition yetali in in Amharic, which means where is con where where can it be found? Where can fitness be found? So they're often conceptualizing it not as what kind of training program is going to get me fit, but what kind of distribution of places and surfaces is going to get me fit. So they would think of it. Um, they would think very carefully about where to go to train on a particular day in order to um to kind of have that balance between intensity and um and recovery i think more than we would maybe um tend to think of it that way because they also have a big choice in terms of um altitude that they can train at so some days we would go to intoto because it was you can get up to about 3300 meters above sea level there and you just run incredibly slowly but aerobically obviously it's still hard But then they could also take a bus down to a place called Akaki where you can be running uh, below 2,000 meters um, altitude. So you can run much faster and it's also about 15 degrees warmer. So often they're thinking about it. Um, they're thinking about recuperation and intensity of, of, of things in terms of the places and the, um, and the kinds of environments as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that was uh, what I was going to ask you next about actually the how to use the environment and Uh, so, so what is first of all? What, what is the altitude of Addis Ababa, where you were based? Uh, it's about two thousand four hundred meters. Okay, yeah, that's 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 pretty high in itself. So you're yeah. you're always going to have a, a big, definitely a big impact of altitude there. Um, so, so what is the kind of their belief system around the the different places? Because that's something that you describe very eloquently, I think, in in the book with 
about the air and the way they view the air in different spots. Can you describe that a bit more? Yeah, so that, that's particularly um, the way that they talk about in Toto, which is the mountain that's sort of behind Addis Ababa. Um, and they would often talk about sort of this special quality of the air that was at the, at the mountain. Um, and that was to do with the fact that it's sort of known as the place where Haile Gebre Selassie used to do a lot of his running. So it has that kind of mystique about it. But there are also a lot of Orthodox Christian churches up there. So people would, it was seen as a sort of quite a special place, I suppose. Um, and then people would also, you know, even people who lived in Addis at 2,400 meters above sea level, they'd go back to their camp, their, the training camps that they lived in when they were um, junior athletes. Um, so they'd go back to Bakoji or they'd go to Gondar in the north of Ethiopia, um, specifically because those places were even higher. <laughs> so they would, you know, even people who were living at 2,400 meters would go altitude training essentially in um, uh, up in, in Gondar where I, um, I wrote a chapter about um, going to a training camp up there. It's They have a track that's at 3,100 meters above sea level. Um, so they kind of, there's this real... Um, belief that the altitude is going to make them um, the, the, make them stronger, I suppose. Yeah, and and if you listen to any physiologist specializing in altitude training, they would say that you should absolutely not go to three thousand one hundred meters and do a hard track workout. But uh, but do these runners still? They do hard workouts, I assume, on that track. It's not just easy aerobic running. They they do work hard as well. Yeah, they do. Um... So I think I wrote about one one session of like kilometer reps on a on a grass track at three thousand one hundred meters where they, they, this guy's running like two thirty for a kilometer up there. Oh, um, <laughs> wow! So it's yeah, they they train really hard and yeah. and that was like it was interesting because one of the the coach at that training camp, um, which was sponsored by the Amhara uh, Water Corporation, so it's like another instance of a uh, kind of state entity sponsoring a whole uh, athletics training camp. But he'd studied, he, he was fluent in English and had studied um, sports physiology, had a degree in um, sports science. And he said, you know, if you read the textbooks, this isn't a good idea, but this is what we do. And it seems to be working. So, <laughs> who, you know, who knows? Yeah, um, I, I, think, I think that's a, a big takeaway from like from your book, from the way that they train. And for me, when I finished the book, the the big takeaway is that, I mean, the best the best outcome doesn't always come from just following the textbook and and i think Mm -hmm. that it just shows how important the psychology the mindset is and uh, like if you can have a place that you believe has some sort of special quality to it uh and and where the air is special and highly give used to train there if i can go to the pool where michael phelps used to train uh maybe maybe that'll make me a better swimmer who knows <laughs> but well, the, yeah. the, but the, the thing is that we can't discredit these things because they all have an impact it's not just about the the textbook and the and the physiology and and i think there are so many great examples uh that uh, that you show in your book about about just that uh so then uh, Another thing that when you mentioned the comparison to the Kenyans at the start of our conversation, and at least when it comes to the Kenyans, one thing that has been said is that uh, their greatest asset might not even be their anthropometry or the fact that they're brought up at altitude and have trained at altitude for their entire life, but the fact that they're training in a group. And that is something that uh, obviously the Ethiopians do as well. Uh, Do you... Do you buy into that, that the group effect is a really, really big asset and a really big factor behind their success? Definitely. And and more than me buying into it, it was, it was the thing that people talked about most in terms of success, that that um, they really had this idea of, of running success as being collectively produced by the group um, and that environment. So, um, yeah, I, I think even more, I don't know enough about, um, about, Kenya really to make the comparison but in Ethiopia they have this this sense that um energy rather than being something that is kind of stored within one individual body and is kind of um contained in that way is something that kind of flows between people um a little bit more so there was this like a, a very strong sense that um it was important not only to train in a group but to have a quite an even distribution of kind of pacemaking responsibilities in the hard training sessions to make sure that 
they were sharing energy equitably amongst themselves. But definitely the sense that by training in a group, they were able to sort of harness that that energy in some way and, and run faster. So they would um the one thing that I found very difficult to master was that people would run actually in time with each other. Um so they would they would have they would sync up their their steps as they were running um and and run in a single file line when we were running on asphalt in a way that was designed specifically to to minimize energy expenditure and to sort of almost mimic the way that cyclists um would approach a team tri- time trial or something like that so there was this very very keen sense of energy as something that was was shared and able to be um sort of utilized and manipulated in particular ways by using the group i think and what is the relationship between the runners in the group are they all very good friends or are they more like co-workers because they're also competitors they're competing for uh, the possibility to go abroad and race for big money and also for just uh, national honors on the national racing circuit and so on so so how does that uh, how, how does the relationship uh, work between them that's a very good question it um it can be tricky sometimes as you say you know there's this very very strong sense that um that success can only be produced by working together so that that's like a given but then obviously once they go to races they're on their own um and they do have to compete against each other sometimes so the the managers would try not to send two athletes from the same group to the same race for that reason mm-hmm. um but it's also true that in order to get noticed by the manager in the first place to get sent abroad you have to be performing in training in a way that um that doesn't fit with this idea that everyone works together and and grows together and that um that there's no competition in training so that there is this kind of underlying tension where everyone what everyone talks about is the importance of um working together and being friends and and everything but like there is this kind of slight tension underneath that um so i describe an argument in the book that comes about because um somebody has been seen as as going faster than the coach asked them to run in training um, about a week and a half before one of the stronger marathon runners was due to go to a race. And he saw that as a deliberate sort of attack on him or like attempt to make him weaker before a race. And that was like a big argument that happened, but it, it, it rarely broke out like that. Usually, um, usually people were very cooperative and there were some very, very strong friendships within the group. But um, I suppose with anything where there's, where the group is like 30 people, there's sort of smaller groups of friends within that. So um, groups of like four or five people who would meet up to go training on the on the easier days as well. Um, but it was gener- generally, yeah. uh, in spite of the few arguments that did happen in, in that in that way, it was uh, generally a really nice kind of supportive um, environment, I thought. Especially with me as well. They were very, was I, I wasn't sure how they were going to react to me being there, but um even though they they couldn't really understand why I wanted to train so hard when I could only run uh, sort of 220 for a marathon was never going to make any money. Once they saw that I'd been, you know, just kind of um, remaining committed to getting up super early every day and going out with them and, and trying my hardest, they sort of, there was a sort of respect there by the end of the time that I was there, I think. And, and that was a, a respect that came from doing the running with them. So that sense of like, social cohesion yeah. that comes with with doing something together i think it's quite strong yeah yeah and uh i mean i i'm sure that the fact that you learned the language in just 15 months as well of, of being there also would have contributed to some uh respect from from the group that's that's very impressive yeah i think that that definitely helps my um harrick's not um not amazing but i speak quite a good specific running based on Harrick, I would say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm able to talk about um training sessions and things like that in a lot of detail. Um yeah. Yeah. That definitely helped. Uh what about the psychology uh and the mindset of, of the runners? Can you can you talk about that and maybe in terms of how it might be different from a typical Western runner? Yeah, so um, I think the the main way it's different is that people didn't really seem to have a sense that they believed that there was anything, any such thing as talent in running, or kind of genetic ability. So everyone, everyone, everyone saw running as something that um, there was a process of adaptation. Basically, was how they described it. So the word that they used for training 
in Amharic was limamid, which literally, literally means adaptation, and which basically was a word that implied that that becoming an elite or world class runner basically just involved allowing yourself the time and putting yourself in the situation where you could adapt to the training that you needed to do to get to that level. So I think psychologically, often um, with with runners in the West, we have this quite clear sense of what our limitations are and roughly you know what our physiological parameters might be people pay to get physiological testing that would sort of tell them roughly where their limits are in Ethiopia most people believe that the, their limit is becoming a world-class athlete so they believe that there's kind of something inside themselves that just needs to be kind of released um, through their running so that's connected as well I think to to kind of religious beliefs, especially amongst um, Ethiopian Orthodox Christians, that they they kind of believe that they might, if they train hard, then God might kind of elect them to this position of um, kind of transcendent athletic ability. So, um, I think I think that's I, I, like I don't and I also I don't really I think there was an obvious sense in which some of the runners were more talented than the others, but I think this belief that anyone can do it obviously helps quite a lot psychologically. Um, but also the the religious the religious belief in some, something that's quite that I think is quite close to an idea about fate or about kind of predetermination that you would that when people ran a bad race they would put that down to um, to God not wanting it to happen at that particular moment and not blame themselves for it. So psychologically, I think that's also quite useful. This kind of because it allows them to have quite an open mind to what might happen in the future. Um, does yeah. that answer your question it, it does uh, it, what about when they're in a hard training session for example did you find that they might react differently to uh, the hardship of just a brutal workout in some ways or uh, in, in terms of how they cope with that um i don't uh actually when if someone was having a really bad workout often they would just get in the bus which is yeah. interesting um so it wasn't the mentality wasn't always you know that you've got to be you've got to prove that you're hard enough to to gut out any session no matter how bad you're feeling it was like you know if it's if it's not there on a particular day you're actually better off um saving yourself and that was also something that would happen a lot in races like i described um the cross country race that i ran loads of everyone kind of set off as if they were potentially going to win the race and then once people realize they're not going to they often drop out so there isn't this sense of like having to um having to constantly prove to yourself that you can get through every single training session people would have quite a sensible attitude i think towards um taking it easier on the days where they weren't feeling right um yeah but the, the main but i think that's like that's the case for sort of individual one-off training sessions but once people once people had decided that they were going to be a runner and that that was going to be their identity they would make that their their identity for sort of um you know five six years to to have that approach to training that is patient and consistent and um committed i think so i think that it, missing one training session wasn't seen as a as an issue but this having a mentality that was accepting that um this was going to be a, a process that was going to take a number of years i think is quite important yeah well that, that is uh to me as a coach that really resonates strongly that that, that is how i would encourage any athlete to think about this well think more about the the big picture and the long uh the long-term process rather than what might or might not occur as a result of any single session because that's not yeah. much to be honest it's the what happens with the the entirety of the program over a long a long and consistent period of training um yeah. what about if uh, we flip the situation its head a little bit and when we have we would have an ethiopian coach or runner would come to the uk for example and get involved in the in the running community there and start running what are the things that they would deem maybe odd or strange in some way or even silly and stupid <laughs> um lots of things i think probably um they well first of all they'd be 
are disgusted at the number of people running on roads all the time, <laughs> telling everyone to get off the roads um, and onto the trails and onto softer surfaces and things. Um, I mean, the running community in Ethiopia looks so different to the running to to running community in the West that it's almost like a categorically different thing. I think because there's no there's not to, uh, with the exception of a very small handful of middle class people in Addis, there's not a culture of recreational running. So you're either a runner and you're essentially a professional runner, or you're or you're not running really. So it's it's really quite different. So I think a coach would come over and um they'd be surprised that at the way that running clubs work as well because in I, I often had people ask me what salary i was paid by my running club in the uk um which is <laughs> because the system is so different in ethiopia where everyone is supported by the club and paid a decent salary uh, and when i explained that you have to pay the running club in order to be a member they they just couldn't get their head around that really <laughs> uh, so that's kind of interesting um but i think they would they would see similarities in the kinds of um social lives that people have around running clubs in the uk in the uk and other european countries i think it's um there there are a lot of similarities as well but they would i think yeah the main thing would be trying they they would be very keen to get people off off the roads and in, onto the trails i think that would be the main thing yeah all right also perhaps uh, um speaking of the get away from gps watches a little bit on the on the easier days of running um there was a quite yeah. an interesting, more selective use of of that kind of technology in Ethiopia, where it was seen as appropriate for um, kind of really hard training sessions, where you really wanted to objectively know what you were doing, but not appropriate for things like running in the forest, where the point was to recover. Um, so, if if people did have a GPS watch in that situation, it would be to see how slowly they could possibly run, <laughs> rather than to keep a track of. Yeah. <laughs> Um, of how quickly they could go so um they would probably have something to say about that as well i guess right uh so that thing that you mentioned about the money and salary from the from the club uh and they're not being really non-professional runners in ethiopia that kind of uh speaks to money being a main motivator motivator for them and that's not to say it in any way as a as a bad thing uh, but it's probably a, just a good motivator and it's one of the ways that they can uh they can make a, a decent living uh, in a country that doesn't have as many options as we do in uh in europe uh, but can you speak to that a little bit like how how important is the potential financial impact of running for them and how big how big a factor is that in somebody choosing to become a runner um, I think it's a pretty big factor, yeah. Um, I think in Ethiopia there has there's been like in like in many countries, I think there's been this sense that um, education used to be this route to a prosperous and stable life with a decent job and a, a kind of salary and a pension and things like that. Um, in in Ethiopia, it's kind of there's this sense that education doesn't really lead to that anymore, or that that kind of trajectory has broken down a little bit. So running is seen as one of the options of, of, of a thing that you can do um, that really does have the potential of a huge payday at the end of it. So um, I think that's a, that's a big factor. But um, but also that like as as you say, there's with the running clubs, um, hundreds and hundreds of athletes who are paid essentially to run full time so it's a, a viable option um for a lot of people to give it a go at least for four or five years without any real kind of financial um uh problems although i suppose there are opportunity costs of deciding to spend that much time running but um i think i think yeah that's that's probably the main thing is having a, having that volume of people who are able to to give running the kind of time and attention and and kind of commitment that it needs in order to to get to that level to see if you can get to that level yeah and and that's probably <laughs> might be the biggest answer to my next question which is going to be uh what factors do you see as the greatest contributors to ethiopian running success and if if i can preempt that answer a little bit what you just said there, there are so many people that are able to run professionally that just through the law of, uh, of of great numbers, that you're going to get some people that are just really good and and can become really dominant uh, at a world class level. That, that's probably going to be one of one of those factors. Uh, having that opportunity, uh, even though that's probably an opportunity cost for other uh, other things. But uh, what are some other things that you see as the 
the big contributors to the success that Ethiopian runners are having? Um, I think, well, there's the definitely, I mean, that, that number of people definitely makes a massive difference. And it also means that the, the quality of like domestic competition in Ethiopia is incredibly high. So if you go to, go to a local race that's organized between the clubs in, in Ethiopia, you see people who have finished on the podium in major marathons finishing 20th in, in like a 15k race and, and stuff. So it, that kind of it, it, incredible kind of competitive environment, I think helps. Um, the altitude must be a factor of some kind. I think the, the overall environment of the kind of choice of amazing places that they have to run uh, must also be a factor. Like some of the places we went to train, um, those kind of Coroconch roads that I was describing that just go on for miles and miles in this amazing um, farmland are just, it's really quite an inspiring, beautiful place to run. That can't be, that can't help, uh, can't hurt, I don't think. Um, but also, I think often when when we sort of think about Ethiopian running and Kenyan running, um, the kind of expertise that we think about is sort of trying to test athletes to see what their VO2 max is and uh, various other different kinds of factors. And when when Nike, for example, did the sub two hour project and things, they were often framing expertise as something that was possessed by the people who were designing the footwear and um, kind of coaches it um, in Oregon and, and things like that. I think we need to like pay closer attention to the kinds of expertise that people in Ethiopia and Kenya have, because that I think the expertise that an Ethiopian runner has is an expertise that comes from kind of learning from, from just observing and running with other people. And it's been passed down from kind of a Bibi Bikula when he won the Rome Olympics in 1960 sort of from from kind of body to body, I suppose, in many ways, in that people have just kind of gradually built up an expertise from training alongside each other and and learning from from what previous runners have done. Um, and I think there's a real pride in that, that from in Ethiopian runners that they have this specifically Ethiopian expertise as a way of approaching running and that that's, that's got to be a contributor to the success, both like in and of itself that, there's an expertise there, but also that there's this belief that the Ethiopian way of doing things is um is is like um incredibly effective. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That comes back to what we talked about a bit earlier: the buy-in uh, and the example there of if you believe that, for example, a specific place has a specific quality or a specific terrain has a specific quality, that will help your adaptation. Then then that might well be the case that it will. It's just about uh, believing in it. Yep. Uh, what do you think that the Ethiopians themselves would say as the contributors to their success, if, if there are, are any differences in what they might answer? Um, they often would talk about hard work or they would talk about, they would say, um, often they would say, Badem uh, Serai in Aharek, which means work properly it doesn't necessarily mean it just kind of goes back to what i was saying about um about how people would drop out of a training session if it wasn't if it wasn't working they would not they don't tend to talk about working hard but they talk about working properly which i think is like quite interesting because it means it suggests that um it's about this kind of overall approach to the to the sport as opposed to just um valuing um pushing hard all the time so i think yeah that that kind of approaching approaching their running in a in a kind of committed um but kind of measured way i think is probably probably what they would say all right yeah and uh now that you're back in the uk what have you personally changed in how you approach your running uh and or even your life perhaps since uh, returning from ethiopia um well, when I when I first came back, well, I used to do a lot of running on on golf courses when I lived in Edinburgh because that was the best way of of, um, of mimicking the kinds of runs that we did in in Ethiopia on the farmland. Um, but I'd say I do I try to do to incorporate some of the kind of um, easy running that I did in Ethiopia in, in the sense of doing these kind of zigzag runs where you just go to a field and and kind of meander around as a as a deliberate way of trying to recover from training. Um, so that's, that's probably the main thing 
that I've brought back. I, I still I do a few of the training sessions that I learned in Ethiopia as well still um, when I'm here. Uh, yeah, I think that would be the, that would be the main thing. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and how, by the way, how did how did that time impact your running fitness? Uh, you had the opportunity to do a couple of races. Uh, what, what was the result of of the training that you did there? Did you see uh, an improvement in your PBs, or at least, or an improvement from the fitness level that you had when you got to Ethiopia? What what happened? Um, I think when when I was there, I was probably overtraining quite a bit yeah. um, because I was trying because primarily what I was trying to do was to keep up with athletes who are significantly better than me for long enough to be able to write about it, I guess. So I think I was, I was sometimes a, a combination of that and the altitude um, probably meant that, um, that I was kind of overtrained a little bit when I was in Ethiopia. But having said that, having come back to the UK um, and kind of implemented some of the stuff that I learned in Ethiopia, um, I did then run a PB for the marathon sort of shortly after coming back. So I think whilst I was not in a, not usually in amazing shape, as soon as I came back from from Addis, uh, it seems like there's been some sort of kind of um, it's had a more gradual effect where it seems to have been beneficial in the longer term. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so so if we can uh, leave uh, one to three uh, key take home messages for uh, amateur athletes listening to this, a typical club runner or triathlete. Uh, based on the experience that you had in Ethiopia, what would those key messages be? Um, I think number one would be trying to approach running in a way that is kind of creative and makes it seem like a bit of an adventure. So sort of actively trying to um, trying to make running as interesting as it can possibly be, uh, rather than falling into kind of uh, boring routines with it. I think that's very important. I think what I was saying about kind of seeing slowness as a skill um, in itself is quite important. So trying to trying to um, separate the the harder training from the easier training a little bit more rather than just doing all of your running at the same sort of speed. Um, and um, yeah, get, getting out onto the onto the trails and and keeping it as varied as possible. Um, I think those would be the, the main three things. Right, perfect. Uh, and then finally, uh, let's finish off with some rapid fire questions. Uh, the first one is: What's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to running or endurance sports? Uh, I'm a bit of a Let's Run dot com addict. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm going to check that every day. Um, but my favorite book about running, I think, is Running with the Buffaloes, um, about uh, Adam Goucher, and it's kind of a um, yeah. I think that's a great book. Yeah, that one's on my list. I was recommended it uh, several years ago, but haven't gotten to it yet, but have, have heard good things about it. Uh, next, what's a personal habit that's helped you achieve success? Um, I don't think I have a, a habit, really, besides that I've always just decided that I'll go running every day in spite of whether or not it feels like I legitimately have time in the day to do it. <laughs> so yep. just deciding that that was something I would do. But I think something that I wrote in the book is quite important, which is about this concept of illusio that I write about, which is kind of playful acts of meaning making that we do in order to make something like running seem important to ourselves. Um, so I think, I just th think it's very important to choose something, you know, whether it's running or pottery or falconry or whatever it is, and just kind of properly go for it. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's important. Just go yeah. pick yeah. something to go for with your whole self. Um, I think. And finally, who's somebody that you look up to or that has inspired you? Uh, I would go with my coach uh, for that one. Who's um, I wouldn't have continued running past the age of about 16, I don't think, if it hadn't been for him. So I happen to live on the same street as a um, as a guy who's in his 70s now, but he ran 2.14 uh, for a marathon back in the 80s. And uh, yeah, he's the one who made, made running seem like it was something um, interesting and important. So... Um, yeah, I go with him. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, finally, uh, tell people uh, again the name of your book. I don't think we mentioned it. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. and, and where, where they can find it and, uh, and get their hands on it and so on. It's called um, Out of Thin Air Running Wisdom and Magic from Above the Clouds in Ethiopia. Um, so it's published by Bloomsbury. Um, where are most of your listeners? I don't um, know. The US, UK, 
uh, Canada, Australia, Northern and Western Europe, uh, across the world, really. But uh, Amazon, um, Amazon has it. <laughs> and, Amazon has it, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure there are local bookshops and yeah. um, other places you can get hold of it. Loads of people seem to be listening to the audiobook um, like you did. Yeah. Uh, that's available on Audible. Um, there's a Kindle version as well. So, yeah, it should yeah. be quite easy to get hold of it. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I can highly recommend it. I think it was a, a great, great read. And uh, do you have social media that you are active on, like Twitter or Instagram or anything? Oh, yeah. Twitter is at MPH Crawley. Um, and I think it's the same on Instagram as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for uh, coming on the podcast and uh, sharing your experience. It uh, was uh, really interesting to hear more. And uh, yeah, best of luck with your continued running and uh, research. Thank you very much. Enjoyed the conversation. I hope you enjoyed that interview. As always, you can find the show notes on scientifictriathlon.com with links to the book, of course. And again, the book is called Out of Thin Air, Running Wisdom and Magic from Above the Clouds in Ethiopia. I can highly, highly recommend this book. Uh, I really, really liked it. A related episode that you might want to listen to if you enjoyed this one is episode 195, which is called Run Training of Kipchoge, Farah and Rudisha with Matt Fox of Sweat Elite. We did talk a lot about the Kenyan runners in particular in that episode and how they train based on Matt Fox's uh, training with them and observing them. So that was a really good one and a really popular one uh, as well. On Thursday, we will have another Q&A as usual. And then next Monday, I interview coach Emma Carney, who is a double ITU world champion and former world number one back in her professional racing days in the 90s in particular. So subscribe so that you don't miss that because it will be a great one. And if you have listened for a long time and are enjoying the podcast, a rating and review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts really, really helps out. So taking a couple of minutes to do that would mean the world to me. If you are somebody that is in the search for a good coach or a good training plan, then I would recommend that you go and check out what we have to offer on scientifictriathlon.com. Well, I would say that without a doubt, the best way to improve your triathlon performance is to get a good coach. I know that it's not an option available to everybody, primarily because of budget constraints. So we try to cater to as many athletes as possible and therefore also offer uh, really good training plans that uh, that athletes are really enjoying and finding good success with. So uh, we hope that this uh, allows us to uh, to reach as many athletes as possible to get you to train to your best to the best of your abilities. Big thanks finally to our sponsors, Precision Hydration, that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Go and take their free online sweat test and get a personalized hydration strategy and get 15% off your order with the promo code thattriathlonshow15 on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Check out their wetsuits, tri suits, swim skins, goggles, high performance eyewear, and prescription glasses and sunglasses. And get 20% off your order with the promo code that you can find on roca.com forward slash TTS. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving craft long.